Yo, 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 football fans, Big D with a week 13 recap on the Big D podcast. Before I bring it out, please subscribe, like, and share the Spunky Spectrum Sports YouTube page. See all my content. Did a stream last night, podcast today, more podcasts coming throughout the week. Hopefully, also check out the Big D podcast for all your audio fans on Spotify and Apple. So, uh, joining us this week, the only man who believes he can beat Tyreek Hill in a 40-yard dash, Bryson DeChambeau in a long drive contest, and Aaron Judge in a home run derby. Who could that be? Hey, uh, just for the record, I've never made claim on any of those uh, (laughs) statements. However, you know, I might give Judge a run for it. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, nice to be back as always, Dylan. Thanks for the lovely introduction. And uh, I'm ready to get right into it. Week 13, baby. Oh, come on. You said you could hit. Come on, Alex. You told me you were hitting 400 yard drives yesterday. Straight into the rough. (laughs) (laughs) That beats the water. It's very true. So, obviously, the most anticipated quarterback matchup, not just of Week 13, but maybe the whole season was uh, Mahomes and Burrow, and Boyd did not disappoint, but for the um, third straight time, the Bengals came out on top against Kansas City 27-24. What's with all these 27-24 games between Mahomes and Burrow? Somebody explain them, apples. I don't know, man. It's It's almost like... Vegas has something to do with it. You want to throw a couple uh, exact score bets down on that one. I think you uh, think we're noticing a theme, and who knows if we see the uh, you know the Chiefs and Bengals play again at some point, whether it's the postseason. I mean, I guess it'd have to be the postseason, but uh, you know, it's always a fun matchup. It's always obviously two great teams uh, going up against each other, two great young quarterbacks as well. So uh, definitely a, a great football game, and boy, that twenty four twenty seven. If we see them in the playoffs, we might have to throw some money on that. Yeah, but um, to me, thinking about this game, I know the final score might not indicate, but I never felt like Cincinnati was going to lose the game, even when the Chiefs got got ahead. It looked like Can it looked like Cincinnati was just a half step in front of Kansas Kansas City. I thought Burrow played really well and made some big throws. That one run for a touchdown was brilliant. He just made the plays when he needed to, and uh. To be honest, looking at Kansas City, I think yesterday, I think, excuse me, uh, Sunday was the first, second time the Chiefs really missed Tyreek Hill because Kansas City didn't have any punch to its offense. While the Chiefs, excuse me, the uh, Bengals offense looked great with uh, Chase. T. Higgins made a couple big plays. If only Tyler Boyd could have caught the easiest touchdown of his life, but him. Uh, would you agree with me that the uh, that the Bengals offense just possess a little more firepower than the Chiefs? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the big thing when it comes to the Cincinnati Bengals uh, organization and really uh, in particular the offense is really it's just a next man up kind of mentality for them. I mean, uh, you know, Joe Mixon's been struggling with an injury. And what has Samaj P. Ryan been doing the last couple of weeks? I mean, he's been he's looked like uh, an RB one of of an NFL offense, and he's their backup, and he's he's still running the rock hard. I mean, he's been a great fantasy addition for me for the last couple of weeks in a couple of leagues where I'm a little low on running back help. So I've been very grateful to him. Obviously, Jamar Chase has been out for a couple of weeks, and we know what C. Higgins has been doing for that Cincinnati Bengals offense. Finally, you know, Jamar comes back this week. And he uh, racks up almost 100 yards receiving. Uh, so, you know, it's just really uh, these players and, and, you know, the coach over there, they, he's he's does such a good I, – I love watching their post-game, uh, their post-game, you know, celebrations, locker room, locker room speeches and everything like that because it just seems like that Cincinnati Bengals locker room is tight, man. They, they really have each other's backs. Like I said, it's a next man up um, kind of mentality. There, it, it really seems like – that football team in particular is uh, just a bunch of group of guys who are work hard, who are working hard for each other. It doesn't matter. Those Bengals that uh, every one of these post game interviews or, or uh, speeches I've been seeing is all these Bengals guys saying they got to play us. Like it's not like oh we got to go play Kansas City and Patrick Mahomes. They got to play us, and and it's something I've really enjoyed watching from the Cincinnati Bengals this season. And uh, they sure do have the Chiefs number. Two other things I've never seen with the Bengals. One, I know people are saying. 
Well, Joe Burrow and the Bengals lost the first two games. Well, they a they both lost. Actually, Cincinnati lost three games on the lap with a late, with late field goals. And secondly, Burrow was coming off an apodectomy, so he wasn't himself until maybe the second half of the Dallas game. And more importantly, the Bengals have been doing a much better job of protecting Burrow. I think. Burrow, I think he was only sacked once the other day, and it, the other day, and it really didn't come until late. It really wasn't. Pass breakdown was Bird just basically giving himself up. Yeah, and you know it's always tough, especially with the Bengals. I mean, last season I don't think a lot of people expected them to make that uh, Super. I mean, really, no one expected them to make that Super Bowl run. We thought the Bengals would be a pretty good football team, but but you know after coming off of a, of a Super Bowl appearance and coming into the season, it's always tough coming into the season as as, as a former Super Bowl team because you know every team you play is going to give it their absolute best shot. There, you automatically put a target on your back. Um, when you have a season like uh, Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals did last season. So, uh, you know, you come out those first two weeks, obviously, like you said, Joe Burrow was uh, dealing with the, with the appendectomy. You play against a, a division rival, you play, and then you go up against the, the Dallas Cowboys, who have plenty of talent on both sides of the football. And, uh, you know, those are two tough games, and it's, and it's a tough start going 0-2. But, you know, those Bengals are going to come back. I mean, it's... It's Joey Burr, it's Jamar Chase, it's Joe Mixon. I mean, like you said, the offensive line has been growing and growing and progressing and progressing throughout the season. And I and we talked about it, I mean, down the stretch last season, every single episode, that's what we're talking about. It's December now, baby. This is the time where these games matter. And you're playing against Patrick Mahomes, and you're really outplaying Patrick Mahomes. And it's a great look for the Cincinnati Bengals going into, uh, you know, the, the do-or-die time, crunch time part of the season. But... Uh, I want to know, Dylan, speaking of the Chiefs, and we've got, you know, we're in December. You got to start thinking about playoffs. You got to start thinking about, you know, seeding and who's going to get that first round by, what your matchup in the playoffs are going to be. And I want to know if you're the Kansas City Chiefs and Andy Reid right now, would you rather would you rather be playing the Buffalo Bills, who were probably a Super Bowl, the Super Bowl favorite going into the season, or the Cincinnati Bengals, who you just can't seem to beat lately when it comes to January in that playoff run? Well, if I'm Kansas City, it's an easy answer. I can't believe I'm saying this. I take my chances with Josh Allen and the Bills because the Chiefs have beaten the Bills the last couple, the last couple of postseason. But Cincinnati has got Kansas City, Sermo, Joe Burrow, and the Bengals don't feel Mahomes. And more importantly, the Chiefs don't have that number one wide receiver anymore. Guess yeah. what Cincinnati's got? Jamal Chase and T. Higgins. Travis Kelsey, if Travis Kelsey's not catching ten balls for one fifty, I I'm not sure the I'm not sure the Chiefs win. Whether yeah, it's that the Arrowhead or Cincinnati. No, I a hundred percent agree with you. I mean, you look at yesterday, Travis Kelsey, four receptions for fifty six yards. I mean, the way the tight end I'm not sure he even caught a got a talking in the first half. Yeah. I, and I mean, the way the tight end position goes lately, I mean, there's really those three or four guys that are producing and everyone else is almost like, a, especially fantasy purchases, pur- purposes, a kind of streaming based on matchup kind of play. But, you know, when you're able to shut down Travis Kelsey, the one of the best players in the NFL and, and by far the best skill player on uh, that Kansas City Chiefs offense. I mean, that's how you win those football games. Like you said, Tyreek Hill's not there anymore. You don't have to worry about that over the top. Tyreek Hill is going to outrun you and Patrick Mahomes is going to outthrow you kind of play. It's really Travis Kelsey over the middle through the seam, uh, quick slants, just get the, the MO for this Kansas city chiefs offense right now is getting Travis Kelsey, the ball. And if you can slow him down, which four receptions for 56 yards is the definition of slowing down Travis Kelsey. You're in a great shot to win that football game. And I a hundred percent agree with you. I think honestly, at this point right now on the bills point, I think this is the most beatable the Buffalo Bills have looked in what two seasons I'd say. I mean, yes, they they um they got a game back this season and and honestly they have a relatively you know the, I I I'm not I'm not discouraged by the Buffalo Bills going to the playoffs as as at the point of getting to the playoffs, but they do not look like the world beater Buffalo Bills that I think the whole NFL was feeling fearing uh in the early parts of this season and and especially last season. But that was not the only football game that went on this week. We have a team who had everyone had very low expectations for uh, who have 
definitely been out producing thanks to their defense and a team who I think many people had high expectations for who are pretty much uh, uh, following up on those expectations. But the New York Jets and the Minnesota Vikings faced off on Sunday with the Vikings. Uh, Jets tried to come back on them, but a, a 27 to 22 victory, I think um, that Minnesota Vikings offense was a little bit too much for the for, for the Jets. And uh, unfortunately, their defense couldn't quite come up and their offense couldn't quite come up uh, with the with the big play at the down at down the stretch of that football game. But what are your biggest takeaways from that? I mean, it was a game I was very excited for going in this weekend. Obviously, the Vikings offense is has looked practically unstoppable minus one or two games throughout the year. And uh, that New York Jets defense is young, but they are talented. So this was a great matchup I was looking forward to. What do you take from that game? Uh, one, uh, can we end the uh, quarterback cares controversy in New York? Because I think that's Mike White's job. I heard Robin Salas saying, oh, plans to have Zach Wilson start. Yeah, what, start in the preseason, right? Yeah. But um, I think Mike White has said in the conversation, I mean, Gary Wilson looks like an offensive rookie of the year candidate. He sure does. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's what just boggles my mind, speaking about Zach Wilson and uh, Mike White, the, the conversation there, it just boggles my mind about this 2021 NFL quarterback class. I mean, the, um, the level of expectations we've had for these quarterbacks and the level of production we've seen from these guys is just wait obviously a minute, wait a minute are you forgetting the guy in Jacksonville Florida that, right? that was, those were the next words coming out of my mouth I was just about to say obviously Trevor Lawrence is having a much better season than he had than he had last year obviously I think Urban Meyer was a big part of that but I mean really the two guys from that draft class are Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields I mean you look at Mac Jones Mac Jones throughout this season has looked in danger of losing and has lost the job on uh, multiple occasions to Bailey Zappi this year. Zach Wilson has lost his job numerous times, and when he's on the field, he doesn't look very productive whatsoever. Trey Lance, obviously the season-ending injury is never a good thing, but um, and of course the 49ers with Garoppolo, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But it's just, it's, you know, these it, it's a testament to the Jets as a whole. It's a testament to Robert Sala because, you know, I mean, I know as good as anyone, a head coach can be an, absolutely franchise altering um decision if you make the right hire and i think the new york jets did make the right hire with robert Sala. they had a great draft class of mod sauce gardner is definitely in the conversation if not the conversation for defensive rookie of the year this year and um it's just it, it, it's a good time for the jets when we might not have necessarily expected it to be obviously they didn't pull it out against a very good minnesota vikings team but there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh Things to reach for if you're a New York Jets fan. And unfortunately for them, I don't think Zach Wilson's going to be the one to get him there. By the way, yes. By the way, I know Minnesota won, but the Vikings are nine and all one possession games, but I'm still worried about Minnesota's defense. I don't think Minnesota can secondary is all that great. If the Vikings aren't getting a pass rush, I think you can throw the ball on them. And I think the Vikings are too awfully dependent on uh, Justin Jefferson. I think they need to get Dalvin Cook the ball more because when Minnesota, when if Minnesota's got Dalvin Cook running the ball and they and the other team's got to bring that eighth man in the box, guess what you can't do on Justin Jefferson? Double, Double him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you're and you're totally right. About, I mean, if you look at the box score, you look at what Mike White did yesterday: thirty-one of fifty-seven, three hundred and sixty-nine yards through the air. I mean, if he unfortunately for him, he had a zero in the touchdown pass column. If you get a one in that column instead of a zero, you win that football game. So well, definitely, Jets got but Jet, Jets got the ball twice in the deep, in the Minnesota territory, and then couldn't punch it in. Yeah, I mean, and, and unfortunately for them, I mean, it's 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 opportunities opportunities that that you miss that can uh, unfortunately cost you the game, which is what happened yesterday. But it's there's plenty of talent on that New York Jets team. It's they're having a season sitting at seven and five at this point in the season. I mean, I didn't see that coming for sure. I remember in our divisional breakdowns before the season started, I had the Jets as a three fo- uh, as a three win football team this year. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the additions on defense and, and, and their rookies really stepping up has helped. I think Robert Sala has has done a better job than I was going initially giving him credit for. 
But um, you know, it's like, and as you said, and and uh, also in that divisional broadcast, I mean, either way, at the end of the day, the Minnesota Vikings are the team in the NFC North, and uh, it's really up to them on on if they can, if they're content with just taking a, a division championship this season, or if they really want to make a big playoff run. But as you said, they've got to get that passing defense. You know, they've got a great safety there in Harrison Smith, but he's got to be able to roam that field, have it be a ball hawk and uh, really make some plays as far as just making sure that you get your offense back on the field. Because we know the Minnesota Vikings, when you think of that team, you think of Kirk Cousins, you think of Justin Jefferson, and you think of Dalvin Cook. Uh, well, it uh, seemed like week 13 was a, an unlucky week for quarterback injuries on Lamar Jackson, Tua, but the biggest injury by fall and the one injury which will have the biggest impact the rest of the season it's Jimmy Garoppolo, season-ending ankle injury, Alex. So uh, my question to you is simple. Are the San Francisco 49ers out of the Super Bowl bubble? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, obviously Brock Purdy looked great against Miami on Sunday, unfortunately. Everybody's, everybody's looked great against the Dolphin defense this year. That's not necessarily true, but I see your point. Um, but either way, Mr. Irrelevant stepped up and proved he was very relevant on Sunday. Um, and, you know, he got the job done. And honestly, I didn't have the 49ers really as, as a true Super Bowl contender. You said, are they out of the bubble? I think they were on the outside of the bubble already. I don't have that much faith. I didn't have that much faith in Jimmy Garoppolo in the first place. I think he's... A little bit more of a product of his playmakers. I mean, you have Debo Samuel who can do anything that you ask him to do on that offense. You add Christian McCaffrey, the one of the most um, uh, utility, all, all-purpose utility running backs that we have in the NFL um, at this state. I think he's a little bit more of a product of his talent around him. And um, I think if Rock Purdy plays like he played on, on Sunday against the Miami Dolphins, I really don't think that this is as big of a, as, as a hit to the San Francisco 49ers that Lamar Jackson would be to the Baltimore Ravens, that, that, that losing Tua would be to the Miami Dolphins. I think that the way that San Francisco 49ers offense is run through Kyle Shanahan and the way that uh, they scheme and, and just how they run that offense, I think you can insert Brock Purdy and almost maybe not be necessarily at the exact same level you were at because you have a, an experienced quarterback under center. But you, I mean, he looked he what everything I saw from from Brock Purdy yesterday was he was throwing balls in tight windows. He was accurate. He was confident. He wasn't holding the ball nervous if he should make the throw or not. He was throwing with confidence. And if he keeps that up, I mean, I, I think the 49ers are in the same boat. I don't think it necessarily drops them out of the playoff con, or the Super Bowl com, conversation, because I like I said, I don't really think I didn't see them in that conversation except on the outside bubble in the first place. So, I, I mean, I think they're right about in the same spot as where I had them before, to be honest with you. Maybe a little farther outside chance, but, you know, I, I, I think there's too much talent in the NFC for the San Francisco 49ers either way. Uh, going into Sunday's game, the San Francisco 49ers were my number one favorite to get out of the NFC. And now the 49ers are out of the Super Bowl bubble because Jimmy Garoppolo, when he's healthy, is the top 10 quarterback. And now the Niners go from Jimmy G to Mr. Irrelevant. And I know what Purdy did in Iowa State, but a rookie quarterback's not winning, particularly not with some of these teams. I mean, yeah, maybe Minnesota's defense is not super great, but you really think Brock Purdy's going on a road beat Philadelphia? No, no, no. But I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo would go and beat Philadelphia either. Jimmy Garoppolo would beat Philly 100%. I would take the 49ers in that game 100%. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, uh, unfortunately for 49ers fans, we're not going to be able to find that out. But, you know, it's 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 definitely a hurt. Anytime you lose your starting – anytime you lose any starter uh, in the National Football League, it's going to hurt, let alone your starting quarterback. And, honestly, it's their backup quarterback because Trey Lance was supposed to be the starter this season anyway. So, realistically, the 49ers are on their third string. But – it, it's it it's a tough it's a tough gauntlet and and you never know what can happen in in, in December and January once we get into that playoff stretch. But Heck, I mean, okay. Kevin Lawrence almost gave me a stroke when the lines rolled them up. Yeah, 
I mean, it'll, honestly, for the 49ers, all you can do is look forward. You've got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this upcoming week. Um, obviously, you talk about great quarterbacks. You're going to be going up against one who just had a big game winning, a, a big comeback victory this week as well. You got the you got the the uh, Seattle Seahawks, Washington Commanders, the Vegas Raiders, and the Arizona Cardinals to finish out that season. The only thing that you have to be concerned about is taking this season one game at a time. Because as I always say, once that once it hits December, man, every game matters. Every game could be the difference between going to the playoffs and not having home field advantage and not. And you can't take a day off. You can't take a game off. You can't take a practice off because this is when it counts. All right. So talked about a couple couple of games on the NFL slate. We had a little bit of some breaking news uh, happen today surrounding the Tennessee Titans. I would like to know, Dylan, John Robinson, the general manager of the Tennessee Titans, is no longer. He is at the moment, unemployed, and I would just like to know, what is next for the Tennessee Titans? I forgot the question I was supposed to ask you about this segment, but I want you to talk about John Robinson being fired from the general manager position of the Tennessee Titans. (laughs) When I saw this news, I'm like, what? What are the Titans doing? Then I'm like, wait a minute. A, I looked at Tennessee's drafts the past four or five years, and the Titans have not done a have not done a good job with first round picks. They drafted Isaiah Wilson, the attack from Georgia, who might be one of the biggest busts in NFL history. I'm not sure he even played a down a meaningful down for the Titans. And then they drafted uh, Caleb Fairley, the uh, cornerback from Virginia Tech, who's not good. Can't get on the field. Doesn't look right. And then this past April, when it seemed like a lot of te- what seemed like a few teams, the Raiders, your Dolphins made big moves in getting wide receivers. The Titans, I don't know, they traded somebody who they traded the only good wide rece- receiver. Plus, speaking of wide receivers, the Titans also traded for Julio Jones, who looked who got who got more what injuries than meaningful catches for the Titans last year? So and then Tennessee traded AJ Brown to Philly, and I don't know, but uh, revenge games usually don't go well. I mean, you see AJ Brown. I mean, forty-one yard out pass touchdown. Then then he was ended up not counting. Next play, forty-one yard touchdown. AJ Brown. AJ Brown wanted this. Wanted to make Tennessee pay for trading it. Well, guess what AJ Brown did on Sunday? He went off. He made him pay. Eight for one nineteen and two touchdowns. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I don't think the Titans would have fired John Robinson not for losing because some teams are gonna lose. I mean the Titans the Chiefs lost in the Indianapolis Colts this season. But it's not just whether you lose, it's how you lose. I think the Titans were frustrated, A, with losing, and B, that their former player came back to haunt them straight in the Philly cheese stick. <laughs> I think the biggest problem with the Tennessee Titans is that they're really their own worst enemy. I mean, you look at this team, and it's it's a bit of a facade almost because – the Tennessee Titans have talent, obviously. They have, Ter- they have Derrick Henry, who, first off, got outrushed by Ryan Tannehill on, uh, yesterday, just just as your crazy WT- WTF stat of the day. Ryan Tannehill outrushed Derrick Henry for the Tennessee Titans yesterday. But I think they, like I said, they're a product They're a product of being their own biggest enemy. You look at, at who they have, and I think John Robinson should have been fired the day that that, um, that A.J. Brown trade went through because – you have Ryan Tannehill, who is a serviceable quarterback. That's about all I'll give him. You have the probably the best running back in the NFL, or at least the most menacing running back in the NFL. You have a couple pieces on the offensive line. You have talent on that team. But the biggest problem with the Tennessee Titans is they seem complacent with being who they are. I look at the Tennessee Titans, and I look at that AFC South. You have the Indianapolis Colts, who can't figure out who's going to be playing quarterback for them. They haven't for the past couple seasons. You have the Houston Texans, who are the worst team in the National Football League. And then you have the Jacksonville Jaguars, who are 
rebuild, rebuilding. They're trying to become what they have aspirations to be, but they're not there yet. And then you have the Titans who can really win this division in their sleep. And to me, it just looks like the Titans are are, are complacent in winning the division, but not challenging themselves, not improving themselves, not bettering themselves, and not really being concerned with ma- being an actual threat in the AFC. In the AFC, you get six almost free wins this season against your division, and obviously, I mean, they're three and zero in the division at the moment. They have a chance to go six and zero in the division. I think it could possibly happen, but I don't see the Tennessee Titans making enough moves, making enough effort, and really trying to go all in. Like you said, the Miami Dolphins have done this season. Uh, and and these teams who are making these big moves, the Raiders obviously didn't necessarily work out for them, but they're at least trying to take that next step. They're at least trying to contend with the other teams in their conference and really try and be uh, threaten the Bills and threaten the Chiefs as an AFC uh, contender. And I just don't see the Tennessee Titans really putting the pedal to the metal and trying to to take advantage of an opportunity that they have to really walk through this division. And it seems like they're happy with that. And that's about all that they want to get from that. So I don't understand what they're doing. I am perfectly fine with them firing their GM because it's, it starts at the top and you have to have that confidence. You have to have that drive from the top and let it trickle down to the rest of the organization. I just didn't see it. But enough of that. We are time. It is time to move into our favorite segment of the show. Everyone knows where we're going with this, Dylan, Mister Dylan. I hear you might have a rant for us today, and at this, the floor is yours. Well, uh, do you know the state? Have you heard of the statement, Houston? We have a problem. <laughs> I sure have. Well, Houston, the Houston Texans should be relegated out of the National Football League and sent to Canada. <laughs> because the Houston Texans may be the NFL's worst run franchise. Absolutely. Get this. This weekend was December 4th. And just think, last year, the Houston Texans were eliminated from the playoffs on December 3rd. And guess what happened to the Texans this past weekend? Eliminated. Yes. And it's not just that the Texans lost again to the Cleveland Brown. It's how the Texans lost yesterday. Did you see how the Houston Texans gave up three touchdowns to the Cleveland Browns? I did. I I don't think I've ever seen... This is unbelievable. Donald Peoples Jones ran back a 76 yard punt return for a touchdown, which which doesn't even happen now unless you're the New England Patriots. But and then I have, I have no idea what the Texans did. I mean, the, the, the Texans fumbled the ball, and then Denzel Ward's pick got got the ball. I'm like, uh, the, okay, yeah, uh, you just give me the ball. I'm running the end zone. It's uh, I mean, I don't know what the Texans were doing. Were they like? Were they like gifting him an early Christmas present or what? I mean, <laughs> I mean the fact that the that the Cleveland Browns did not score a single offensive touchdown. The Cleveland Browns scored a punt return, a fumble return, and an interception return for the for a touchdown. The Texans got a safety. The Cleveland Browns starting quarterback Deshaun Watson, as we all know, went twelve for twenty two, one hundred and thirty one yards passing. Zero touchdowns in an interception. Nick yeah. Chubb, who I expected to run all over. I, I I thought it was going to be a Nick Chubb day yesterday. 17 for 80 yards. It's respectable, but it's the Houston Texans. I expect at least triple digits out of Nick Chubb. I just cannot believe the Houston Texans held the Cleveland Browns, well, held Nick Chubb to under 100 yards rushing. Obviously, Kareem Hunt added 56 on top of that. Deshaun Watson added 21. They ended with 174 total rushing yards. But you hold Nick Chubb under 100 yards. You have Deshaun Watson with a 53.4 quarterback or, uh uh, a passer rating, a 28.5 QBR, and you lose by double digits. I mean, you almost get your score doubled. It's just, 
I, I feel bad for Texans fans. I felt bad at, at Hard Rock Stadium two week, uh, or last week when I was watching Miami put up 30 points in the first half. It's just it, – I mean, it, it's a garbage fire. It's a dumpster fire. It's something that I don't see any hope in fixing anytime soon. It's it, – it, it, I'm sorry, Texans fans, because it's, it's – it, I've been there. I've been at the bottom of the NFL as, as, as an NFL fan. It's not fun. And even even then, I, I I saw some sort of light at the end of the Miami Dolphins tunnel. I do not see the only thing the Houston Texans have going for him is Damian Pierce. And by the time they have any sort of things figured out, he's going to be retired. I mean, the Texans are so bad. They've made so many mistakes. I mean, they signed, they got David Colley to be the head coach last year. And I thought the Texans were good. I thought the uh, young quarterback, uh, who's the uh, Texans young quarterback? I can't think of his name. Kyle Allen or Davis Mills? Davis Mills, thank you. Davis Mills. Look good. And then all of a sudden they bench him for Kyle Allen. I'm like, I want to see Kyle Allen. I want to see Davis Mills play. And then Kyle Allen can't play. Simple as that. I mean, the Tex- Texans botched him the DeAndre Hopkins trade. Basically yeah. were forced into releasing J.J. Watt. Gifted Miami, Miami multiple picks for Miami Tunsil. So, I mean, and then this year they're what one ten and one. I mean, Lovey Smith is probably going to get fired or should get fired. Yeah. I mean, t- this is the NFL's worst franchise right now. No question about it. I mean, they won uh, one I mean, football they, game this year and they, they scored thirteen points in that game. It's just it, it's and and, and I'll, I'll give you and I'll give you a hint who that team was against because yeah, you know that off, you know that game very well. I know you do. They have kicked all butts the last what. Seven or eight times we played them. I just don't understand what the thought process is in sitting Davis Mills. He's you draft a rookie quarterback, you're not doing anything this season. Why not give? Uh, I mean, this is his second year, he's not a rookie anymore. He was part of the 2021 draft class, but why not give him reps? Why not give him these reps to at least see if you have something that are worth developing? Unless you've already given up on his career a season and a half into it which does not sound like a very good idea in my point. I mean, what do you have to lose with keeping Davis Mills out there and at least at least just further evaluating him, at least just getting more more tape on him and, and more things to be able to, to say, hey, this is what you did. This is what we can work on. This is how we can develop you. You go back and forth between Davis Mills and Kyle Allen, like you're, you're not playing for anything this season. You're playing for the number one draft pick. You may as well... At least, uh, unless, I mean, and if they have given up on Davis Mills, that's fine. I mean, it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the most loaded quarterback class coming up this season. It's, I it's, it's, it's young. Yeah, and I mean, I, it's not even, I, I wouldn't even consider Bryce. I mean, we, we've been spoiled with the goods uh, at uh, of uh, college quarterbacks coming out in draft classes. I think it's a little bit underwhelming. Uh, you know, even even this year's draft class with, with Kenny Pickett and, and, you know, Malik Willis has had a couple moments, but he hasn't done too much. It's I just I don't understand the thought process unless unless you've already given up on Davis Mills, which I guess I mean, a season and a half into his career, I guess you can say you have the right, but you're not going anywhere anytime soon. It just it doesn't make any sense to me. I think Houston should lose his first round pick for other failing. Yeah, I mean, everyone said the Dolphins were tanking. I mean, we. The, the, that Miami Dolphins tanking team did not look as bad as these Houston Texans did. I'll tell you that much. Hey, hey, because of the Houston Texans, you were, you were able to rebuild your team. I love the Texans. No, I, I'm very grateful for them. The Houston Texans turned Waddle the Miami Waddle. Dolphins organization around. Thank you for the picks for Larry Tunsil, sir. But, you know, it's just, I, I mean, just as a, as a fan, just seeing, I mean, you know, obviously there's parody in the NFL every week, but – you got to know when you're going up against those Texans, except for the one off week for the Jaguars. I mean, you, you got to be expect. <laughs> Sorry, but I mean, we put up 30 at halftime, Dylan. It's you should be able to you shouldn't be too worried about seeing the Houston Texans on your schedule. I'll say that to say the least. <laughs> All right, Alex, thank you for joining me today. And uh, hopefully your Dolphins will like Southern California better than Northern California. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't talk too much about that game. Uh, Definitely a frustrating one for sure. But uh, thank you for having me on again, Dylan. 
a uh, little bit less spicy of a rant as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, but you know, we'll give it, we'll give it to the people anyway, but uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to see, talk to you next week after the Miami Dolphins beat Justin Herbert and the LA Chargers in primetime football. Fins up, baby. <laughs>